Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here, and today we're going to take a dive into the important facts and figures from Elon Musk's presentation last Saturday. Now, there is actually a huge amount of breakdown here, even after all of the information was shared over the previous week as Starship was being assembled for the presentation. Now, since the presentation, we had this wonderful little shot from inside the Starship's cargo bay. The header tanks here are mounted in the tip of a nose cone to offset the engine weight at the rear. It's really massive inside here. Now, I'm unsure exactly how much cargo capacity there is inside, but certainly enough to hold almost anything you could imagine needed for a future mission. So what have we learned over the last week and why is there so much excitement of this amazing vessel? A little clip here just to start as we need to remind ourselves about the main drive behind SpaceX and of course also around our love of everything going on with the space engineering industry right now. Be concerned about, um, there's, there are many troubles in the world of course and we, th these are important and we need to solve them but we also need things that make us ex excited to be alive, that make us glad to wake up in the morning um, and be fired up about the future and, and think, yeah, the future's gonna be great. You know, and, and this space exploration is one of those things. Um, and becoming a, a space-faring civilization, being out there among the stars, this is one of the things that I, I know makes, makes me glad to be alive. I think it makes many people glad to be alive. It's one of the best things. And this, this really, we're, we're, we're faced with a choice. Which future do you want? Do you want the future where we become a space-faring civilization and are in many worlds? and are out there among the stars, or one where we are forever confined to Earth. And I say it is the first, and, and, and I hope you agree with me. Yeah. Regardless of whether you love the look of the Starship prototype here or not, one thing that I hope you all agree with is how exciting it is to see the space industry being pulled forward by SpaceX. If the other space agencies don't start to compete with these new reusable vehicles, they're simply going to die off. It really is as simple as that. Starship, of course, will take reusability to the next level, bringing the cost of getting mass to orbit right down compared to even the Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy, which in a good majority of cases smashes all of the other launch vehicle costs. Now the presentation was on the 28th of September which was the 11th anniversary of the very first successful flight of the Falcon 1 which was its fourth flight. Elon Musk and SpaceX quite literally had this one chance for that mission to succeed otherwise we would very likely not have SpaceX inspiring the world with these new amazing rockets. We got a great deal of detail on the test process that is intended for the first Starship prototype to go through. It will essentially be a little like the first Grasshopper vessel or the Falcon 9R vessel that was used to test landing capabilities that would eventually be used for the awesome successful Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. This time though, the tests are going to be a little more crazy. One of the first tests is going to be a flight to fly to 65,000 feet or 20 kilometers and come back to land. Not only this, they do plan to use the four fins to control the descent and also conduct a test of the belly flop to tail down maneuver. If everything goes well, this could happen within the next two months, which would be extremely fast considering the ship only really just got rapidly assembled last week. Now, what tests do you think are going to run prior to this 20 kilometer flight? I imagine there will be a number of smaller exciting tests within this period, such as static fires and perhaps even a hop test or two. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Interestingly, Elon tweeted this week essentially saying that if the 20 kilometer flight goes well, the next would be orbit. Now this version of Starship is the very first Mark 1 version. Mark 2 is being constructed in Florida and it's not overly clear clear yet how much difference there will be between these two vessels. The Mark 1 version of Starship is around 200 tons when empty, which is quite a lot heavier than what they're aiming for with the Mark 4 or Mark 5 versions, which SpaceX and Elon Musk plan to be much lighter at around 120 tons. Quite a difference here at 60% the weight of the current Mark 1 version. Presumably this will be done by quite significantly reducing the thickness of the plates and re-engineering more efficient ways to build out the support structure. For the moment though, they haven't needed to worry too much about efficiency in this build simply because this version is only going to be running a number of reasonably low altitude flight tests. Well, low altitude compared to the next iterations of the vessel anyway. 
Here are the stats we were all waiting for though. Ignore the dry mass here, Elon Musk mentioned that this was a mistake on the slide. We can see that the vessel should be able to transport 150 tonnes to orbit with full reusability. Now this is a fairly significant increase to what Elon mentioned in 2018 when it was estimated to be around 100 tonnes. Now obviously this will very much depend on how much they can reduce the dry weight of the ship in future versions. What is super awesome though is the launch cost of this fully reusable system. It's essentially just the cost of the fuel to fill the Starship and Super Heavy booster up. Now what I found interesting was that the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy use two and a half times the liquid oxygen than the rocket propellant, which for the Falcon rockets is a highly refined form of kerosene. Now the new Super Heavy and Starship will use three and a half times the oxygen compared to the liquid methane fuel. Now this gets quite crazy if you consider that the fuel itself can potentially be generated right from our own atmosphere. Elon Musk did touch on this saying that SpaceX do plan in the future to produce the propellant for Starship from solar power by extracting the fuel right out of the atmosphere which is then you know the same technology proposed to be used in the future on Mars as well. So. To do this, hydrogen is combined with carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, with methane then stored as fuel and the water side product electrolyzed, providing oxygen to be liquefied. And this is then all stored as the oxidizer. Now, setting this technology up as a test case on Earth first simply makes sense. And by doing so, spaceflight with Starship can essentially be made carbon neutral. Currently, the emissions from rockets are negligible simply due to how infrequently they are launched around the world. But to become a real spacefaring civilization, we're going to need thousands of launches each year. It is great that SpaceX and Elon Musk are already planning a way to offset this. It remains to be seen, of course, how much fuel can be generated in a short period of time using these forms of carbon capture. It is an area with a lot of research going on for obvious reasons. What do you think though? Is it possible with current technology to make rocket fuel in this way at this volume in a carbon neutral way? Or is this something still a long way off from a technological point of view? Keeping in mind, of course, that to fully fuel the Starship will take around 1,200 tons of propellant, and then the Super Heavy will take another 3,300 tons of propellant. That is a crazy amount of fuel to generate from carbon capture technology. Now, Elon talked quite a lot about the aerodynamic controls of Starship on re-entry. The method of control is not overly different from what we learned in 2018. It's really quite different from anything else we've seen in the past though. Many people keep saying that it's no different from the space shuttle, but it is in fact very different. As mentioned in the presentation, it is actually a lot more like a skydiver than an aircraft. It's essentially a controlled fall where the fins are used not like wings, but more like air brakes. By extending and contracting the fins on the rear of the ship or the front of the vessel, the ship can be made to keep itself orientated so that the belly of the beast faces the direction of travel as it enters the atmosphere. Now, this exposes the maximum amount of drag possible to slow the vessel down gradually as it enters from orbital velocity. And at the same time, the entire body can be angled in such a way that it can gain a great deal of lift, keeping it in the upper atmosphere longer to allow it to bleed off speed in a controlled way and limit the gravitational stresses on the vessel as needed. What they also want to do here, of course, is control the maximum heat as it re-enters through different layers of the atmosphere. I just can't wait to see some real data on a re-entry like this. I will say the simulation here shows quite an aggressive flip. I'd hope it's not going to flip over at quite this speed though. I imagine in reality it's going to flip over just a little earlier with less horizontal velocity. Otherwise, this is going to be pretty nuts. It's going to make everyone pretty sick. Imagine being in the belly of the beast with a flip like that. Now, this first prototype will have only the three sea level engines incorporated into it for these initial test flights. These engines will be able to move up to around 15 degrees, giving it the ability to control the direction of thrust to help steer the vessel. 
The future versions of the ship will then have an additional three vacuum engines fixed in place with a much larger nozzle making it quite a lot more efficient in a vacuum. One of the biggest changes to the design over the last 12 months has been the shift to using the 301 stainless steel for the body from the previous idea of using some sort of carbon composite material. Now although steel is heavy in comparison it is very strong at cryogenic temperatures rather than other materials that become quite brittle. Not only that but um, it has a high melting temperature unlike materials such as aluminum. Now because of the flexibility of the 301 steel they actually need a lower amount of it for construction making the overall design quite light in comparison to what most of us would have imagined. Another huge benefit is the cost per tonne. Carbon fibre Elon states is $130,000 a tonne whereas the steel is only $2,500 a tonne. That makes it 50 times cheaper for the same material that would be used to construct the vast majority of the Starship body. It's also worth noting here that the steel is a super awesome material for general use and it's easy to weld and manipulate if needed. You could even see an old version of the ship being decommissioned and repurposed into other structures on Mars in the future. This is almost impossible with materials like carbon fibre. Now this year we also saw the introduction of a heat shield with these new hexagonal crack resistant ceramic tiles. These will be covered on the windward side of the Starship whereas the leeward side would not need any shielding at all due to that high melting point of the steel. This is quite a change from a previous proposal that was intending on utilising a transpiration cooling system by slowly bleeding fuel from the body to help cool the ship. I personally like this idea better as the heat shield should be able to block a good majority of the heat and divert it away before even hitting the body and this method does not rely on sacrificing any fuel or liquid to keep the vessel cool. It does remain to be seen how easy it will be to ensure the tiles are relatively maintenance free between flights. One of the major issues with the space shuttle of course was the massive amount of time and resources that went into maintaining all of the heat shield tiles. The updated booster design here is interesting as well. It is designed to take up to 37 engines. The idea with this booster is that engines can be removed depending on payload needs. Now Elon specifically said that the engine configuration could be as low as 24 here so this is a very configurable booster that seems to be designed in a way that would allow SpaceX to fairly rapidly take engines out. The power of this booster is what is particularly incredible if it does indeed fly with similar specifications that Elon is talking about in the presentation. He mentions the total thrust of this booster would potentially be around 7,500 tons of force which is around twice the force of the Saturn V and compared to even the Russian N1 rocket that never managed to reach orbit it's got around 150% the thrust of that so it's just incredible. Ideally SpaceX would like to achieve a thrust to weight ratio of 1.5 or even above which is better for reusable systems. This is the core reason why there are so many Raptor engines crammed onto the bottom of this booster and why the Super Heavy is such a monster. It will easily be the largest rocket ever launched and I've got to say I really want to be at that first flight. Don't get me wrong the first flight of Starship is going to be incredible but this full stack with Super Heavy that's going to be something else entirely. Interestingly Elon mentioned that he wants to avoid an entry burn completely so the booster is intended to be pretty darn strong to take that kind of heat. Only the seven center engines would be used for the boost back and landing with the touchdown probably just being the three Raptors by the looks of the presentation video. It does look like the bottom of the booster is slightly flared here at the bottom possibly just to make some extra room for all of these engines I'd say. I mean this is so cool. The six landing legs here also look interestingly like fins but these are actually just legs. They look to be fixed in place from this design and it seems from the simulation that the booster will be at least for the short term be landing on a pad rather than simulations in the past showing the booster landing directly on the launch mounts. Now this is probably a good thing anyway. It always seemed just a little risky to me to land like it was previously proposed. Beautiful footage as well of the Raptor engine being test fired here. This is I think the nicest footage we've seen so far of the Raptor. 
Elon Musk mentioned the rollout for the future iterations of the Starship. Now, what we can see here, of course, is Starship Mark 1. Mark 2 is being constructed in Florida right now, but as soon as these two are completed, or perhaps even before, both sites will begin working on the next version of Mark 3 and Mark 4. These next ships won't be built plate by plate like the vessels we are seeing here. Instead, SpaceX are going to attempt to literally take the coil of steel from the mill unspool it, change the curvature to a 9 meter diameter and do a single seam weld, which I believe just means that there would be one vertical weld for each cylinder rather than many vertical welds joining separate curved panels together. So Elon is saying the schedule of these builds could be quite crazy. Mark 3 is around 3 months from now, Mark 4 within 5 months, and then perhaps achieving orbit with Mark 5 in 6 months or so. These times seem even more wildly optimistic than usual for Elon, but I will say I've been very surprised at how rapidly the Starhopper and Mark 1 Starship has come together. So yeah, what do you all think? Is it going to follow these timelines or not? All these Starships are being built before the first super heavy booster, mainly Elon says because the Raptor engine production is the limiting factor. Currently, they're able to churn out a Raptor every 10 days or so, but the target for early next year would be one Raptor engine every day. Once they have a good backlog of engines ready to go, it will make much more sense to kick off the development of a Super Heavy. When it comes down to it, the booster is a much simpler structure than the Starship itself, so I'd hope the Super Heavy would be built very rapidly even in comparison to the Starships we're seeing in development right now. Nice shots here again of the refueling process. The butt to butt docking is still the way to go by the looks of it. The way this works is a tiny thrust is essentially applied to one side of the vessel to push the fuel from one ship to the other. To refuel the ship fully would take quite a few trips. If the payload is 150 tons, this would mean around 8 refuel trips to completely fill a starship in orbit. You can see now why Elon Musk is talking about building many ships. Ideally, there would be several going at once to refuel a big future mission to deliver 150 tons to the surface of the moon or even to Mars. Now speaking of the moon or Mars... It's exciting to have a base on the moon even if it's just a science base that you know we have for example we have a base in Antarctica for science research and this would be an incredible area of research so whether or not people want to live on the moon there's definitely a lot of science to be done uh, but the, the critical thing that we need to focus on I think is the fastest path to a self-sustaining city on Mars this is, the, this is the fundamental thing. Now just a few final points I found interesting from the questions and answers before we wrap up today. Questions were asked around when we could see humans on board Starship and what the process would look like getting to that stage. Now Elon replied to this saying that SpaceX will be able to do many flights very quickly to prove reliability, potentially even one flight per day if needed initially, which is just insane to think about. In the more distant future, the suggestion was made that we could be seeing flights occur four times a day. Elon also mentioned a potential plan to land a few ships on Mars before for actually sending people. This could well mean there would be a few hundred tons of cargo and equipment already sitting there before humans even touch down. Perhaps even a boring machine would be useful as it could not only create a safe underground habitat for humans to shield themselves from the radiation on Mars, but it could also create vast amounts of building materials. Combine this with a few special order Teslas that are decked out for the surface of Mars and Elon can tie all his companies together here into an amazing settlement decked out with the latest and greatest tech inspired by the real world Iron Man Elon. So I'll leave you today with one of my favorite parts of Elon's presentation. But before that, a huge thank you to everyone for making it this far. If you have enjoyed this video, please do consider liking and subscribing. It really does help me a huge amount to keep creating content for you to enjoy. Any questions, of course, pop them down in the comments below. Thank you again, everyone, for watching. And we'll see you all in the next video. If the design, if the design is takes a long time to build, it's the wrong design. This is the fundamental thing. Over and over, it's, it's like the tendency is to complicate things. And I have another thing, which is like, the best part is no part. The best process is no process. It weighs nothing, costs nothing, um, can't go wrong.
the, the thing I'm most impressed with in when I have the design meetings at SpaceX is what did you undesign? Undesigning is the best thing. Just delete it. That's the best thing.